So Pam, introduce us to your family and specifically Stella. Tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah. So Stella was our firstborn. She's six years old now. She's an amazing kid. She's silly, funny, <laughs> wild. Um, and then there's Marshall, who's three now. Um, and then Aubrey just joined um, this year. She's almost 10 months. And then there's JC or Jason <laughs> and I. Um, and yeah, that's our, our little family right now. Yeah, and, and Daisy. So we are recording <laughs> this at the end of November. So yeah. When we started the day, it was cloudy, but now the clouds have parted and it's gotten a little warmer on a late November afternoon as we arrive at Stella's house and are met with a very warm and friendly welcome. I'm Seth Carnell, and this is the Go Shout Love podcast. Stella is six years old and lives in the Indianapolis area with her mom and dad, Pam and JC, along with her adorable siblings, Marshall and Aubrey. She is known as being silly, curious, and energetic. And you only have to be around her for a few minutes to see that her love for letters and numbers is extraordinary. Today we are talking with her parents, JC and Pam, who will tell us about navigating life with Stella's coffin Cyrus syndrome and autism. Life doesn't stop with a special needs kid like Stella. For example, the family recently moved for JC's job, as families tend to do, But JC and Pam talk about the challenges of a physical move to a different state, friendships, communities, and of course, insurance along with Stella's medical journey. Pam and JC are easy to talk to, and we are very grateful for their authenticity and for opening their home for us to invade. In this conversation is Josh Veach, our executive director of Go Shout Love. You will also hear Marshall in the background occasionally. He is a loving big brother. Here we go. Right after everything, yeah. How did you guys meet? In high school. We actually, we were both in a marching band together. Okay. He was a percussion drummer boy, and I was in the color guard. Um, and yeah, the rest is history yeah. from there. 2007. <laughs> Went to Steak and Shake for our first date. Yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, that was very romantic. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I th- we used to, my wife and I used to go to Steak and Shake in college all the time. Heck yeah. Yeah, great shakes. So good. Hard to beat. Yeah. yeah. So good. So you guys grew up in um, in the Indianapolis area or where are you from originally? Yeah, in Carmel, Indiana, right above, right north of Indianapolis, okay. just on the north side. And we had been there ever since. We, yeah. We've been there, yeah. We live literally lived within like walking distance of each other throughout our whole life. It's really crazy, honestly. Huh. Like we were in yeah. the same neighborhoods, like growing up when we moved, like we, our families moved at the same time. Yeah, it's well, just we weird. Didn't, like, we didn't meet until high school. Oh, wow. No, we didn't yeah. know each other. It's a big school. Yeah, too. he's it's a year younger area. too. Well, that's kind of funny. We were so close. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so it now is. you've moved to closer to the Cincinnati area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, we'll get into a little bit more of of um, Stella's story, but you've mm-hmm. we're just sharing before we started that there's a there's a major difference in the care or the resources available mm-hmm. um, for a kiddo like Stella mm-hmm. in Indiana versus Ohio. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about what that has been like to navigate a move. Yeah. Um, and either have to plan for or discover along the way these things that are different just by crossing state lines what's that been like so he got his promotion and we immediately knew like okay we need to figure out services for Stella like that's our first main goal is like she has great services in Indiana like she did the early intervention program there she went straight into ABA services and she I mean she was doing so well over there and we're like we know what services work for her but how do we get that in Ohio. Um, and so in Indiana, we had so many people that were able to help us like find like the waiver program and help us through that process. In Ohio, we don't have anybody. So it's like, okay, who do we contact to figure this, this out? And so even before we moved, we reached out to different agencies in Ohio that, um, are helping special needs families. And so we're like, okay, so, what's the process? How do we get ABA services? And they're like, well, 
not a lot of kiddos do ABA in Ohio. And we're like, well, that's kind of weird. Like, why, why not? And they're like, a lot of kids just go to the school district. And we're like, well, we get that. Like, I mean, that's right. But Stella has just extra needs that um, that educational setting is not going to, to me. I mean, she needs toothbrushing and all this other life skills care that she um, wouldn't get in that setting. So we're like, okay, so how do we get ABA services? So I talked with this um, one lady and she was very kind and walked me through the process. And so I was like, okay, when we get to Ohio, we just need to get our address, need to get like our deed that we live here. Um, and then we can apply for this and apply for this and we'll get services started like right away um, unless there's wait list or whatever. And then we got here and they're like, no, that's not how the programs work at all. And we're like, oh, OK. So, I mean, we've been here a month. Um, we've reached out to the school district. Um, it seems like we have to go through the schools to get services started for Stella again, which is not the case in Indiana. Um, you don't need like an IEP or anything written from the school stating that she needs ABA services. It's all done through insurance. So it's just completely different. And then we move over here. They're like, no, you need an IEP. You need an evaluation completed through the school district. And we're like, OK. And then the school district is like, well, you have to find your ABA provider before we can do an evaluation and even schedule an evaluation and all this stuff. So we're like, OK. So we've been going to different places and. It's just not when we went yesterday to a place, it was just a very different feel when you walked in, like there were no other kids there. And it was like, this is not like how it was in Indiana. It was just very different. Like in Indiana, you walked into the ABA center, there's kids running around. It was just a very friendly environment. Like even though they're doing intensive therapy, it just, the feel of it wasn't like, oh my goodness, we have to learn. Like, I don't know. It's not, it's just different. And so now we're like, okay, we need to go to these other places. And we called a program today that was like, that was highly recommended. And they were like, we don't take any children that aren't potty trained. And we're like, well, that's not going to work for us. Like Stella is still is not potty trained yet. She's not going to be potty trained in the near future. Like she's not ready for that. Um, and so well, she was very nice and offered us different suggestions, but just going through the process, like, just figuring out what needs to be done to find the right place for her is just completely different than it was in Indiana. And even though, like, I feel like in Indiana, I knew, like, what the process was. It's just, like, you get somewhere else and you cross the state line and it's like, whoa, this is a whole new territory. And with, coming with a move with three kids, it's like, wow, that's a, a lot to navigate and juggle and try and get all the paperwork that you need from the other places, too. It's sure. just a uh, lot. It's information overload. <clears throat> Indiana is... I think it's controlled by the state level, Ohio, it's by the county. And it seems like Ohio needs to get on the same page because we've heard, oh, this is what you have to do. No, that person's wrong. This is what you have to do. No, both those people are wrong. This is what you have to do. It's like, can somebody just like come help us? Yeah, it's just the runaround game. Also like getting on like Medicaid and Indiana Medicaid paid for ABA. ABA is like $90,000 a year. So insurance would pay for it. And whatever insurance didn't cover, Medicaid would cover. So we never paid like anything yeah, out of pocket for yeah. Stella to be in those services. But in Ohio, you have to get like an autism scholarship yeah. from the school. But that only covers like 32000 of it. Yeah. And then insurance is supposed to cover like the rest of it. But their Medicaid waiver here does not cover those services fully is what it sounds like. So it's like, well, you are going to have an out of pocket for these services. Yeah. And I'm like, that's just crazy. You cross the state line and you're like, okay, now you she have to pay the for the needs. same yeah. services. Right. She was it's automatically potty needs. trained when we came to Ohio. Like, yeah, it's just, it's just absurd. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's hard trying to figure it out. And As if moves aren't stressful enough. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I'm unpacking a house and having three kids and Getting yeah. brother enrolled yeah. in school and Aubrey like needs Halloween. daycare and working. It was working. like our second day. Yeah, yeah Halloween yeah. was our Great first day. Great way to meet day. the neighborhood. Everyone's super friendly yeah. around here, though, which is really nice. That's yeah. what we're pretty mm -hmm. much used to Yeah, it's in just, Indiana. Yeah. It's, just... it's just different because our family, I mean, our support system is in Indiana. Like, both of our families are there. All of our siblings live in Indiana. Like, literally 20 minutes from our house, you'd be at our siblings. And so we lose that coming here and then losing all the services, too. It's just trying to find your yeah. footing i feel like again yeah all our families there so like all the cousins which are like automatic friends for stella <laughs> it's like they're yeah. already signed up and now yeah. 
it's hard enough to make friends like as an adult, but even when you have kids, you have to find other adults with with kids and you have a special needs kids, then you're like in a whole other ball game. Mm -hmm. So it's it'll be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. how how it goes yeah once we get more but, settled um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> too early to tell really making friends yeah what was outside of the the uh built-in friends as, yeah. as far as family mm -hmm. uh how did you guys go about that before you moved and connecting with other families whether they were you know on a similar journey mm -hmm. or not yeah yeah so i mean a lot of our friends like are just from high school um we didn't really have yeah. like too many uh, like extra friends after we had kids I mean your whole life kind of gets consumed by your children and what their needs are and Stella especially those first two three years it was like Stella is our life right now like it is she's the main character so we have to make sure she has all of her services get her therapies in running around all of that and so it was it was all Stella all the time so we're lucky that we've had friends that I mean, it's hard for us to reach out to them just because we're so busy all the time yeah. that have reached out to us yeah. and stay connected to us. And luckily, we have good friends like that that reach out and like, hey, how are you guys doing? Because I feel like I've been terrible yeah. about that. Sure. But our family, I mean, they're always there for us. And we're lucky we yeah. both have big families. I mean, yeah. I've got four siblings. He's got three siblings. We have a big family. So we have good friendships built in place. And then we reached out. I mean, once we got a diagnosis, found other friends <laughs> nearby yeah. with Julia, Ruby's mom, and yeah. um, Katie, who you guys are going to meet later on, Lauren's mom. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the other families, uh, a little girl named Willow. We have a chat that we talk every day um, and just we at first it was all like kid stuff like oh does your kid do this and it gradually kind of just became a friendship yeah. and I feel so comfortable like reaching out to them like with any issues that we have or oh I'm frustrated by this and it's just nice to know that they're there and they're in the same situations too like they I mean have been through what similar what we've been through and obviously their stories are very different but it's all that medical journey yeah. and they know what it's like to have a kiddo that that needs yeah. extra things and understands that lifestyle. Yeah, we have friends with neurotypical kids, but and we try to go and see them, but it's hard to get out one with three kids of any mm -hmm. any kind. But that was still like we just have to have a game plan for wherever we go. Like, what is she gonna do there? Is she gonna have space to? You know what's the time limit we have on it so mm -hmm. it's just kind of challenging well, and but... then like covid was in there oh, too. Yeah. like <laughs> once yeah. we started to feel comfortable like oh stella's at a good spot like she's older now she can she can yeah, play by herself same. a little bit more like at her gtube feeds had decreased we're like okay her schedule's so much better but then covid hit and we're like well we can't i mean we can't risk getting her sick and go out so we're like oh gotta stay a little bit longer right, so yeah. i feel like that was difficult too i mean we had ABA that at yeah. home. That was rough. Yeah, yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> As you think back um, through this journey and specifically the relationship with the gals that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the points where uh, you kind of leaned into those relationships mm -hmm. um, and how did that, how do those relationships sustain you through tough times? Yeah. Um, I think we all kind of lean on each other, like, um, like when some of our kids get sick or something, like we always reach out to each other, like, oh, like the, we see like the, the nose, like your nose starts running. And to most kids, that's not like a sign of anything. You're like, oh, they've got a cold again. But when you notice that in one of our kiddos, it's like, oh my goodness, are we going to have to go to the hospital? Like, are we, what's the temperature? And so we check in with each other, like every morning, if one of our kids is sick, we, how's Orin doing? How's Ruby doing? Like, are they feeling better? Like, what's the temperature? Like those types of things. Like we reach out to each other to make sure like each other are doing okay, because we know how that is and how scary that can be too. Um, like when <clears throat> we're trying to find services for our kids, like, that was one of the things like Ruby, um, Julia had reached out to me just asking about like Stella and what she was receiving with ABA services. And I was like, just go tour it. Like it's a good location. It's a good place. And um, like being so close was so nice because she was able to go to the same center as Stella. And it was just nice to have someone that like a familiar face, you know, like when you go into those places, you already feel like at home. Um, just because there's other kids that have similar needs as your child. Uh, but then seeing a kiddo that has the same syndrome, has the same diagnosis, it's, it's just different. 
Um, so being able to reach out to them, even like on other stuff, like with other people getting married or like, um, like Katie found her husband when we were all chatting at the same time. So like when she's excited about that stuff, like even stuff that doesn't pertain to our kids, like reaching out about the move and like how stressful it can be just overall. And just having that relationship is so important. I mean, I've gone to two of their weddings now, so that's been kind of cool. Like just having those relationships and feeling comfortable, like getting together, like sometimes it can be weird. Like you don't see each other in person all the time, but I mean, it was like no time had passed when we got together to go to Julia's wedding, um, at the beginning of November. And it was, we had a blast. I mean, it was so nice to take that time away and not even have our kids with us, but just be connected and, I mean, we're always going to be bonded because of our kids, sure. but it's become so much more than that, that we can reach out for really anything. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. It's it nice really has to been. not have to worry about like, oh, your child is having a meltdown like on the floor. Like, that's fine. <laughs> My kid's next. Like, yeah. You're doing a G-tube feed. It's like, you don't have to pause. Like, this is a G-tube. This is how they get their nutrition. Yeah. It's just all understood. You know, it's... Mm-hmm. Everyone already knows, like, yeah, it's totally this is normal. Just, this is normal. Just yeah. yeah. There's a conference every year for Coffin Cyrus mm-hmm. Syndrome. And when you go there and you see all the kiddos, which is, they, it's a spectrum, even within the syndrome that we know of. And it's just so nice to see, like, this is just normal. <laughs> like, yeah. Home, yeah, it's yeah. really great. There, there are other people who walk in a path that's very similar yeah, to what you're exactly. doing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you can feel so isolated when you get that diagnosis. Yeah. But, once you realize that there's other families not too far away. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I feel like Indianapolis is one of those areas that does get more diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. They seem to do more like genetic testing there. Yeah. Um, so Who that's pretty cool. Rare yeah. It is. It just takes an expensive genetic test <laughs> to figure to find out. Yeah. Diagnose. Yeah. yeah. We're going to come back to <clears throat> some of the medical mm-hmm. past and how Stella got, like, what her journey has been like up to this mm-hmm. point. But I want to know about Stella, the person. How would JC, how would you describe Stella's personality? She is so she's so goofy. It just cracks me up. She's so funny and ornery and she's smart. And she's so smart and she's just so silly. She loves to be upside down. She mm-hmm. loves to smile. And when you hear her laugh, it is the best thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean she's just so smart and silly. I love it. Even when you go in at night, you're trying to put the other kids to bed because she goes first. For some reason, she's <laughs> she's first to bed. <laughs> she's she's ready for first it. To bed. And then you see on the baby monitor, oh, she's turned on her light and she's taking stuff out of her drawers. And you're like, Stella, what the heck <laughs> are you doing? And you open the door and she just laughs so hard. And you're like, you know, like I have to keep it together because I can't. You really can't be like, oh, you're so silly and make a game out of it because then you're done. Right. <laughs> then it's game over. So you're like, you have to go to bed. But even that's like the best. Yeah. Anytime she connects with you and looks you in your eyes oh, yeah. is amazing because that doesn't happen so often. But not even just the eye contact, but just seeing her smile mm-hmm. and just like grabbing her and Connection hugging her. With you. <laughs> yeah. 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 She is, uh, she is something else. She's put us through. It's pretty interesting, like, her being the first kid, like, but we're so, like, Pam and I are on the same wavelength pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, we're pretty much go with the flow or take it as it is, count your blessings, however you want to put it. You know, even when Stella was a baby, like you said, we'll get into the medical stuff, but it's just. Yeah, this is this is Stella. Like it's it's all good. She's our she's our baby. She is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What. I'm sure you're proud for a ton of reasons, but what makes you what makes you most proud to be her dad? Man, I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin. I'm proud of everything that she's accomplished because you never know like she's gonna be able to walk. And even when you get the diagnosis, mm-hmm. it's like we now we have a name for it, but that's all we have. That's all the neurologists could tell us. Here's the name. I Googled it. And I'm like, okay, well, who knows where <laughs> we're gonna end? Like she can eat on her own. We can almost get rid of the G tube. Mm-hmm. Um I think pretty soon we just need to make sure she's okay without it. But Mm -hmm. I mean, just all she's accomplished has just been amazing and still being able to smile. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially when you move, like you can't really prep her like Stella, we're moving to a new state. Like we're going to be in a whole new area. She's not listening to that. Mm -hmm. So just seeing how well she's been able to adapt and find joy in, you know, where she can put her letters in the new house. Like, so that's awesome. How adaptive she's been with, you know, maybe not understanding everything that's happening in her immediate mm-hmm. vicinity is pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'm proud because she's made us, you know, better parents. We yeah. were already, <laughs> we were the only parents. Yeah. That was our first parenting <laughs> experience. But it's made us, it's uh, helped us develop some good skills. So I'm, I'm proud to be her father because she's been able to teach us stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of those things that she's taught you or those skills you've developed? Oh, patience, um, <laughs> understanding for like, especially, I mean, if you're out in the supermarket and people are staring or like kids are staring, it's like, it doesn't really like bother me anymore. You kind of get used to it mm-hmm. and you can use it as an educational piece, but yeah. also maybe don't like look at the kid and be like, I'm, I'm coming, <laughs> like, get your eyes off my daughter. <laughs> like, it's like, fine. Like, um, just being able to brush stuff off your shoulder. and Yeah. Kind of just roll, go with the flow. And yeah, really, patience. And yeah. Learned a lot of medical stuff, too. We've had sure. doctors <laughs> like, are you guys like nurses? I'm like, no. No. Just because we can put in a G-tube and NG tube and yeah. Just learned a lot along the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. honestly, and we still will. You know, that's, I don't yeah. try and think about the future, like, too much. Like, oh, when she gets into school, like, what are we going to do when she's older? Mm-hmm. Who's going to take care of her when we die? Like, yeah. who knows? Um so <laughs> more <laughs> progress to look forward to for personal growth but you know like we said one day yeah. at a yeah. time for now let's just mm-hmm. find her some freaking services in ohio <laughs> yeah. yeah they can get get it together yeah. yeah pam what would you say she's taught you um some of the same things i think i used to be like a very stressed out person like i was like very anxious i still am <laughs> But I've gotten better, honestly. It's been kind of crazy, like, going through a lot of that stuff. Like, it, I mean, she put us, made us very stressed (laughs) when she was born. But now as we get more, like, punches and things happen, it's like, things are going to happen along the way. It's just how you deal with them and just kind of rolling with that, too. Like, things are going to happen. You can't control everything is one of the things that I learned. Like, I can't be in control all the time. I can't fix every little problem and just kind of realizing that as like a parent like I can't fix everything I can't make everything just with a snap of my fingers better I think it's just taught me that you just got to kind of do your best and make make do with what you have to and keep pushing for better things to happen too because if you just sit there and don't make changes then it's not going to (laughs) happen be very 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 like you got to advocate a lot yeah. as a parent. And that's something that I wasn't good with before. Oh. I was <laughs> shy Just and so meek. so good at and, it now. Yeah, yeah. And now we, you have to. You do what you got to do. And that's kind of what I've learned. Like, just push for what you need. and But at the same time, like, it's, it's, it is what it is at some points, too. Like, it's, it's okay. It's going to be okay no matter what. So I think that's yeah. kind of the biggest thing. Like, it's going to be okay. Like, so in some ways, Stella's actually helped you find your voice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for her. Yeah, she has. Definitely. I mean, she can't talk on her own. And she's obviously using a device or a communication device. But um, she's not fully functional with it. But she can't tell us her needs all the time or her wants. So really listening to her <laughs> nonverbal needs and wants is really in advocating that for her and knowing like when you walk into a facility is this going to be best for her like knowing her really well is I mean and being able to say like this isn't this isn't okay for her yeah (laughs) that's not okay that one we saw yesterday was like an episode of Black Mirror it It was was, it was really odd there was nothing on the wall yeah it was it's this place. Yeah, That's wild. So, knowing, so like, we're advocating by not going to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not going there yeah. and finding better services. Yeah. <laughs> Keep pushing. <laughs> we'll find it. <laughs> what are some of the things that Stella loves to do the most? Play with numbers, letters, looking at things from all different angles, being upside down. She loves playing outside, going for walks. Oh my gosh, if her stroller's out, she'll run to it and be like, oh, I want to go for a walk. Yeah. She, she's so funny. She'll just hop right in by herself and be like, okay, buckle me in. Um, ready to go. She likes going yeah. to the store and reading all like the labels and things. And just you could walk around a store for hours and she'd just love it. She just loves it. Um, what else? Yeah. She likes swinging. Swinging is Swing. a big one. Yeah. Spinning around in circles. She just loves that. Yeah. That'll light her up. Anything, um, letters and numbers. <laughs> Noblesville has a, at Christmas time, they put up like big letters, like in the, not in the yard at a park, 
that are, you know, pretty high. They're pretty big letters. It spells out like Noblesville. And Taller than her. <laughs> she just loses her mind. It's so funny. But <laughs> screaming, letters and running, numbers. Yeah. Anything like different with letters and numbers. She has her number, toys, and letters. But like there's that tree, like that countdown. Mm-hmm. Like she doesn't see that. Like two to 24. Like what a, or one to 24. What a weird thing. Mm-hmm. And she loves it. Just because it's different She'll carry numbers it and different. It makes it challenging when we're looking for new toys at Christmas time. <laughs> yeah. You just um, hope that they have new letters and number toys yeah, come likes out. Writing <laughs> Cross the car. your fingers when you search on Amazon. Yeah. yeah really. <laughs> There's got to be something new. Well, she, um, <clears throat> before we started, she was, uh, she had a giraffe uh, number, like that the different blocks had numbers on them and it made, they go into the shape of a giraffe. Mm-hmm. She was moving so fast, just putting oh, those yeah. numbers. Oh, yeah. I mean, she knew exactly what numbers oh, yeah. were next. Her memory is and good. Her memory's real good. So good. She spell lots and she of can stuff. like remember, like if she left a puzzle piece on the other side of the room, you're like, where's number 16? She'll be like, I know exactly where I left that and like run across the room, go grab it and come bring it back. And you're like, how do you remember? Like, yeah. and she knows know like the correlation, the like those pieces, they have the numbers on top and on the other side, they have the alphabet too. So she knows the correlation, like the letter I is the number nine. So if it's flipped over and you see the I, she knows that's nine and then she'll be able to put it together like that too. She's just, her yeah. brain just works so amazingly, honestly. Like yeah. she just has that, that yeah. memory and just understanding. It's, it's crazy. JC, Gosh. you mentioned earlier that she has um, a diagnosis of autism in addition to the um coffin cyrus is that Mm -hmm. do you think that that is that part of being this being on the spectrum with the memory it seems like is that part of that it seems like part of autism um it seems like kiddos with autism Mm -hmm. sometimes focus on one item whether it's like dinosaurs or animals and they can learn a lot about them it seems to be similar to that it's hyperlexia yeah as well where kids can learn can Mm -hmm. read before they can there's yeah like a sub diagnosis of um uh autism called hyperlexia which isn't really something that kids get diagnosed with but a lot of parents have diagnosed their kids with it just because they have a certain interest and are able to do these things that they really shouldn't be able to do at like those young ages like she started putting her alphabet lining them up in order at 18 months and we were like how do you know your ABCs already? Like we didn't work on it. It was just something she knew. And then she started spelling like her first word was car. She spelled out with magnets and we're like, how do you know how to do this? And they're like, this is amazing. And so we researched and find that there's like a subcategory of autism called Mm. hyperlexia. And that has been beneficial to know that she has that probably um, to help with communication and knowing moving forward, how are we going to use this, strength of hers right. to push her and help her succeed using the skills that she has because i mean it's amazing what she's able to do with letters and numbers that are put in front of her yeah mm-hmm. so in the community in the uh coffin cyrus community that you've been connected with mm-hmm. is autism being part of that pretty common it is like it. yeah there's um, so within like cough and Cyrus, there's different genes that are affected. Um, Stara, Stella has a deletion um, on her arid one B gene, um, and so that is what causes her diagnosis of cough and Cyrus syndrome. And um, there's a lot of information coming in about arid one B and that specific gene being linked to diagnosis of autism. And so obviously they're researching and finding more information all of the time. Um, but a lot of kiddos that have that arid one B gene change mutation and deletion, um, that a lot of those kiddos seem to be diagnosed with autism as well, which is really interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, tell us a little bit about, um, the initial diagnosis and kind of what, what life was like in the beginning with Stella. Mm-hmm. It's wild. It's hard to think back. It is. It's hard. Like, she's six oh, now, right? She's six yeah. now. So, yeah, it's been six years, and it's been a journey. So, I mean, it all started when she when I was pregnant with her. She, um... <laughs> well, all they need, my mom needs a all they pass a fire. Okay, it's you want to go room. grab it from her room? You got it. You're you got such it. a good helper. Good job, job Marsh. <laughs> he is pretty good. He's a pretty good kid. Yeah. Okay, go with Daddy. Thanks, bud. He runs with whole body he's up. the clumsiest yeah. kid in the world. Like, if he's running, he's gonna fall. It's like, where is he gonna fall? 
And what is he going to (laughs) hit? It's usually how it goes. But yeah, Stella's medical journey started, and we didn't really realize it at the time, but when I was pregnant with her around um, 32 weeks, um, she just kind of stopped growing. She was... um, she everything looked fine and they did ultra ultrasounds but she just stopped kind of growing she um each week they'd be like her measurements the same everything's the same and then her kick count got low um and so i had to go in and do like um the stress test where they count her kick movements and make sure everything's okay and everything was okay it's just kind of okay why isn't she growing um and so they diagnosed her um with iugr um or interuterine growth restriction and so she just kind of stopped growing at that point um and so they decided to take her a little bit early so she was born at um 38 weeks um and she was born via c-section because she was breached so from the get-go oh she's yeah. <laughs> she's got to start something a little bit different and so um they took her a little bit early she was born four pounds 14 ounces and um like when she was born they had like the NICU people in there like ready to kind of see what was going on with her and what was causing um the IUGR but they were like everything looks fine everything's good and so we're like okay like yay she gets to come back to the room with us and right from the get-go she just had a difficult time like latching and and feeding and they tried I mean everything lactation nurses coming in like surrounding me um and she everything they tried like bottle breastfeeding putting a tube like a tube on my finger for her to suck on like everything just was not working she was so tired lethargic she would get maybe like half I don't even know 15 mls um and just she just could not continue and um like they basically said like oh just give it time it's going to get better um she's drank a little bit here and there like just like give it time she'll be okay and so as new parents were like okay like it'll just get better like when so they sent us home and they're like everything's fine she'll she'll get better on her own and um we had to wait a couple of days to go to the pediatrician because it was the 4th of July weekend and so um there was like an extra day that we had to wait where typically you go back like the next day or the day after um and so we waited a little bit extra and she was still struggling to eat but we were able to get a little bit here and there and um she was doing okay um but when we went to that first pediatrician's office like we told her like hey like she's not eating very well she seems tired a lot of the time and they were like oh she's just little she's just young give her time she'll get better as as time goes on and we're like okay so trusting in them I mean we were like okay like we'll give it time and then later that night she got so lethargic like she was not like we get her undressed we put like cold washcloth on her she was not moving we're like okay we've got to take her so we took her to Peyton Manning Children's Hospital and um, they admitted her because she was not eating so failure to thrive um, was her diagnosis at the time and they like I mean going into the ER like they had to put an IV in and uh, she didn't even like flinch she didn't move she didn't she was so lethargic that she was just like didn't even feel it it was crazy and so they admitted her um and started um an ng tube um through her nose to get some something in her to hopefully once she got some nutrition that it would kind of build up that strength to help her be able to continue to eat and so we had speech therapy come and do um bottle feedings and trying to get her sucking more and we were there for I think five days um, five or six days and um, we did that and they sent us um, we had the NG tube and they were like okay continue with the NG tube I don't think she's going to need it for much longer um, but kind of continue with that and so before we left I mean we had to learn how to put an NG tube in and it was (laughs) the most traumatic day I think of my life trying to stick this little tube up my four pound baby's nose and there's so many people around you and the pressure and you just want to go home like you're like I just want to get out of here but it was so stressful and trying to get that in it was like the worst feeling in the world but we were able to both learn how to do it um and so they sent us home and went to the pediatrician they said Um, She seems to be doing okay. She was taking like some, I mean, half an ounce, ounce here. And they're like, she's doing pretty, 
pretty okay. Like she's taking more orally. Um, so we were like, okay. And so they're like, okay, I don't like probably a month later. They're like, she probably doesn't need her NG tube anymore. She's gaining weight. And we're like, okay, that's great. Um, and so like we took it out thinking everything was going to be okay. We, we thought like, do we need to go see GI? They're like, no, she seems to be doing okay. She's gaining weight. So we're like, okay. So we continued with that. Um, and just wanted her to gain weight. We did weight checks, I think, every week <laughs> to see how she was growing. And um, with the bottle feeding, I mean, it was <laughs> so hard. I mean, trying to, to get, asleep. yeah, she had to be asleep to eat. We had to get her the right bottle temperature. The lights had to be off. It had to be like everything had to be just right to get her to eat. But somehow, I don't know how we did it, but we were able to get her to continue growing with that little bit of like she was so she still wasn't eating a lot no she was drinking like six eight ounces a day yeah but somehow gaining weight i don't i don't really know they would start to like fortify her bottle so you would increase the calories so add more formula to the water to to make it more um nutritious for her and she didn't have to drink as much so that she'd gain weight and so we did that and i mean she stayed off the ng tube for for a while um but it was literally that struggle of like <laughs> she's not eating enough yeah. like it, it, putting she, her to sleep yeah. the right temperature mm -hmm. and that was just normal for us i mean it, we had just gotten yeah. used to it and then well and then eventually we, somebody said yeah. Like, we, what the heck oh, neurology. <laughs> what are you doing yeah so we and then we noticed that she started having like delays with her milestones like she's not looking at us she's not babbling or smiling at us and so we're like there's something else going on too and she's so moving. Like, yeah she had these crazy movements are mm -hmm. she would like flap her arms and like i don't know she was doing her something body else. would yeah. just kind of like jerk around like a lot but not like a and so we're like there's something going on so we're like okay let's go to gi see if she has reflux and that's why she's oh, moving yeah. a lot and see right. why um, she's, she's not eating a lot. Is it hurting her? So they diagnosed her with a really bad, um, reflux. And so they gave her some medication for that, but it still didn't really like fix any of those issues. Um, she was still not eating a lot. She's still moving a lot. She still had delayed milestones. And so, um, we started occupational therapy and physical therapy with the early intervention program to get her sitting up on her own, getting her drinking more from the bottle, um, just building those skills. And, um, I mean, it helped a little bit, but it wasn't getting any better. Um, they did, uh, swallow studies to make sure she wasn't aspirating. We had to start thickening her liquid so that she's able to drink, um, putting rice cereal in her bottles, just anything to get her to eat, we would do. We were like, we'd wake up every three hours at night, set an alarm. Like she wasn't waking up, but we we were waking up to to be able to feed her and to make her make sure she was still growing. And so, finally, I was like, I feel like some of those movements, like they weren't getting better with the reflux or anything. We're like, is there something motor wise going on that's causing her to jerk so much and move so much? And so we got a referral to neurology and the neurologist. Was that something that you had to pursue? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. Every little So you thing. learned pretty early that you had to stop just saying, okay. Yeah. You had to yeah. push in a little bit well, and we, push back. Well, we went through two pediatricians. I finally found one. Of, I used to teach um, kindergarten and one of my um, kindergartners te or parents was a, a pediatrician. And so... I felt comfortable like reaching out to her personally and being like, okay, we've had all these issues going on with her. Like, can we be one of your patients? We had to drive 30 minutes to our pediatrician's office, but it was worth it to know that it was someone that we trusted and would give us good advice. And so we started seeing her um, and she was the one that sent us to neurology. And the neurologist was the first person I feel like to really listen to us like we had seen GI before and they're like oh she'll grow out of it she'll like with age her muscles will get stronger she'll be better there was finally some validation to yeah. all the things you guys have been saying so much like, what, 11 months um she was probably eight when eight we months saw neurology yeah neurology and then when we went to neurology we told her about like her sleep schedule and how we're trying to feed her all all crazy times of the day and we have to do this and do that just like that's not normal. <laughs> She's like, you guys need to really push for GI to place either an NG tube again or place a G tube because this is ridiculous. Like, this is not how you should live your life. Like, yes, she's gaining weight just 
barely, but it's not enough. And so she was the one that called GI and was like, you're not doing enough for this child. You're not listening to this family. And literally the next week we had a G-tube surgery scheduled and it was like, Okay, someone's it was, listening what to a relief. us. It was a yeah. very good GI doctor, too. Yeah, and it was the very highly rated. Like, well, no. I mean, it's Peyton Manning's Children's like, Hospital. Yeah. Like, it was hard. It was very frustrating because yeah. we're like, we knew something was wrong. I mean, literally at her pediatrician's three-month appointment, I was like, I think she has autism. And the pediatrician, like, laughed at me. Like, she's three months old. Like, you can't diagnose that. And I was like, well, yeah, I just autism. feel like there's something, like, there's just something off and it's not... Like, we're, it's not connecting. She's not eating right. Like, there's something else to this. And she's like, oh, well, we'll keep monitoring, basically, is sure. kind of what we kept getting told. Um, and so the neurologist, <clears throat> she obviously got us started with the G2, which was fabulous and helped us. Oh, oh yeah, lifesaver. Yeah. <laughs> lifesaver. Um, but she also was like, maybe she has CP, um, cerebral palsy, because of her movements and how she can't control these movements. She's constantly moving. Like, you could barely, like, I was nervous having family members hold her because well, yeah, she would she move back, so yeah. fast. And it's like, she's going to fall out of someone's arms because they don't realize yeah. that she's, she's going to move so much. Yeah. And so that was scary to me. So, um, that was, I mean, she was like, let's just do a genetic test just in case. Before and then they send if, us to Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah, if she doesn't have any genetic um, mutations or deletions, then I'll send you to Cincinnati for their motor clinic. So we're like, okay. So we figured like, oh, we're going to get sent to the motor clinic. Cause she was like, I don't think she has anything. Like she looks like, I don't think like, I wouldn't guess that she has any genetic. So you get a call that. The results are in, but they don't tell you over the phone. What's going through your mind when you get that call? I was scared, nervous. I uh, just wanted to know. Like, you can't just call and just say, hey, we have an answer, but not give an answer. Um, so they asked us to come in, like, as soon as possible. And I'm like, we're there. Like, give us our answer, basically. Like, we want to know. And so we went over to um, the ne- neurologist's office, and she, like, sat us down, and she said she has coffin Cyrus syndrome. We're like what is that? Like, I don't know what that is. And I, my first question was, what is the life expectancy? Like, that is like my biggest, like, what, I mean, what does it look like moving forward? What is the, what is her life going to look like? You know, like, and she was like, they don't really know because there's not a lot of information on coffin Cyrus, but she said like, it's nothing like right away. Like she, she basically said, I can't give you like an answer, but she's doing okay now, you know, Mm -hmm. like that's basically what they can tell you. And so we're like, okay. Was the neurologist familiar with it or was this brand new to her as well? No, it was new for her too. So she, I mean, she really couldn't give us any answers. She gave us a paperwork that basically like said like that she has coffin Cyrus. She has another deletion um, that doesn't cause like a syndrome just that we know of of yet. Um, But she's like, this is what it is. And it basically stated that, She'll have developmental delays, um, that she might have hearing or vision problems, heart, yeah, yeah, speech delays, um, her heart, heart check, defects, kidneys, kidneys checked, kidney, um, yeah, her, everything basically like just basic. And yeah. she's like, well, don't Google anything. We're going to send you to a geneticist, um, call them and get, let's get that scheduled. And so. Of course, you can't get into a geneticist like the next day or anything. So it was like a month until we could a see the geneticist. A month of no Googling. Of no right? Googling. Yeah, yeah right. Of course, we get, yeah. 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 <laughs> we get to the car. Yeah. We get to the car. We're like, group, Google. On yeah. Yeah. Found yeah. Group. We found the Facebook group. Um, which had the most information, honestly. Yeah. It, it opens you up to other kiddos that have that same diagnosis. And yeah. you're like, wow, this is amazing. And I think that same day I posted on the group and was like, hey, my daughter was just diagnosed like tell me everything you know basically like connect with us because yeah. we've been going through 11 months of not knowing right. what this is trying to find answers and now we have an answer but it's not really an answer like it doesn't give us any like sight into the future or knowing yeah. what her life is going to look like and like it's just interesting like so many people from all over <laughs> just reached out and we're like hey and that's when we like I got my first message I think from Eric um Ruby's dad um and he reached out and just said hey we live in Carmel like and I'm like this is crazy like oh my goodness so I think we messaged back and forth like just about like our kids and like what like what 
like just asking questions about like what is she like and what does she like to do and just wanting to know that your kiddo has like a group that she belongs in and and she like we felt so comfortable like reaching out to them and oh she has like we had to do like endoscopies to check like her throat and her stomach acid for her reflux and stuff like that like oh she has this procedure coming up like has anybody done this before like what is it like and just having like those people that have been there done that like had older kids with css and just like they had answers like it felt like they had answers and it was really comforting like a lot of like with her reflux and all of her gi issues everyone said like just give it time like it'll get better with time and um that like made me feel like a little bit more comforted like we can't fix that overnight like we were mm-hmm. trying to find answers and answers and a lot of kiddos with cough and cyrus have gi issues and that's just kind of typical and a lot of kids have g tubes and it's like okay like this is this is normal like it's nothing that we did and i mean you shouldn't think that way anyways there's nothing that you do to to right. really hurt your kids but, but it gives you a chance you to do. take a deep breath yeah and it like was, yeah like the world like i was other like people oh my going gosh, through I it too breathe. yeah, yeah. It, and it did mm-hmm. it this that connection was huge and then moving forward it was just one of those things like it gi did get better with time like we did occupational therapy <sighs> physical therapy speech developmental therapy we did all the therapies um to push her and really get her like what she needs to be able to do walking um eating i mean as she did get older like that reflux did fade away and she did get stronger and um i mean she's had other things along the way like getting her ears checked and luckily she has no hearing issues or anything like that her eyes checked i mean her vision gets worse (laughs) every time we go unfortunately and i think that's just something progressively that's not going to really get better um so monitoring that she had to her eyelid droop so she had to have an eye surgery um to help with that drooping and we'll probably have to do it again because it's it's, yeah, yeah starting to droop again um so that that was challenging we did that last year and uh i mean a lot of those gi issues those first two years just figuring out her feeding once we got the g-tube it was like okay like we can feed her she's getting nutrition and that really helped her grow i mean like getting that nutrition was like (laughs) key she was able to start walking start (laughs) moving start i mean you can't do that when you don't eat yeah Yeah, you have to eat um and so that was a huge i mean piece like getting her her crib and we'd get up in the middle of the night because we couldn't just feed her a whole bunch you have to increase (laughs) her stomach size she gets bigger yeah and the cord would be like draped over the crib and you, we'd have to like sleep right next to her well, during her, her hour feed. long feed yeah. to make sure Lay she didn't like floor. pull the cord out. Yeah. So that was, those are core memories locked away. <laughs> but it's such yeah. a relief. It to was. have a name to it, a community. Mm-hmm. Then we, there's a doctor, Dr. Vergano. Yeah. Who works, she has a coffin series clinic. Yeah, she specializes yeah. with it. Yeah, so she's a good resource. You know, we had a good geneticist. geneticist yeah Genetist. um, um <laughs> in indiana <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what we have in cincinnati yeah. but they have a good children's hospital so i'm sure we'll be set up well yeah. but it's it's hard to go back down memory lane because yeah. you just kind of like forget about it you yeah. do it's in the past but, but yeah. she's i mean she's made so many growth i mean so much growth like slowly yeah. introducing new foods and like, oh, she could, we used to blend up, like, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, so she would get, She had two sandwiches like, today, text- you said. Oh, yeah, yeah she ate a full, yeah. yeah, two peanut butter and jelly. She, she will eat. She will yeah, out-eat you now, awesome. and yeah. it's, like, She's done good to about think stopping, about, like, though. Like, yeah. It's not, it's not like she'll just eat until, like, you know, you have a dog, and you're, like, you would eat yourself into a coma. <laughs> but now she'll, like, she'll stop. She'll like, at first I was worried up. about that. Like she's just eating because it's habit, or she likes the taste of it. Like mm-hmm. I do sometimes, but she's pretty good at being like, "No, I'm done." Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it sounds like one of the things that was helpful is mm-hmm. that you guys immediately found a community mm-hmm. right after mm-hmm. that diagnosis, even before you could get into your next appointment. Oh yeah. Um, are are there, in addition to that, is there anything else, any advice mm-hmm. that you would give to families that find themselves at the very beginning of a diagnosis journey? Go for it. Go with your gut. If it doesn't seem right, mm-hmm. always advocate. Always check and recheck. Trust but verify. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it doesn't pass the smell test, then something's probably not right. Mm-hmm. It doesn't hurt to go. Yeah. And early intervention too, I think, yeah. would be really good. Use your resources that are available to you. Like, 
I feel like when we first got a diagnosis, they give you so much information, like, here's all these programs and everything. And you're like, I just need a moment to like process right. first and then figure out what we need and things like that and just process that. We do have a diagnosis now. And then then we can work on next steps. Like take that time to process first to think about what her really needs are. And then you have a diagnosis so you can use that to get resources. And um, I work with the early intervention program for the state of Indiana. And so I help families all the time that get new diagnosis and help them find resources that are going to be helpful to them. But the first thing is just like take a deep breath. Like you have an answer, but it doesn't really give you the answers for your kid because your kid is going to be different than another kid, even with the same syndrome. You look at two neurotypical kids, they're not the same anyways. And so everybody's different and your child's going to need different needs. So even though like um, other CSS kids might need this therapy or this therapy, that's not something that Stella is going to need. So just knowing your child and really pushing for what's available for them is going to be what's best for them moving forward. And as a parent, you know, you know, your kid the best you're with them all the time. Like don't let other people tell you what is going to be best for your kid. Cause yeah. they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. They might think they know, and they might yeah. have more medical degrees than you or more educational degrees than you, but you know, your kid and just finding the resources that's available. I mean, we've gone through it almost two times now yeah. finding resources and just keep calling and pushing and finding what's going to be best for them. Yeah. And keep forward. advocating. Yeah. Advocating, keep advocating. is huge. Yeah, we need huge. to get more involved with, I don't know, laws and yeah, <laughs> vote, go out and vote for sure. But yeah. I don't know when we have a little more time <laughs> that we might get a little more involved about when trying to make down. it easier for other families. Yeah. It is just, yeah. So it other should be easier. Don't move to Ohio. It should be easier. Yeah. Yeah. It really should. Mm -hmm. It should be, it shouldn't be insurance people making decisions on how many hours of service a kid should get from an insurance claims adjuster right. type person. Like, what do you know? They are not best positioned to no. understand what's best for Stella. No. It's too much no. of like a business. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. being run as a it's business, a business right. and not really. For the kids. For the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fact that Indiana has a two-year wait list for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Like, holy Waiver. cow, two years. Like, two years from the age, like, two to four. Like, that's pretty important <laughs> developmentally. Like, yeah. you know, families can't afford to pay this stuff out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Especially for, like, ABA, which has been a proven yeah. a good thing. I know it's, sometimes it's controversial and depends on where you go. But if it's right for your kid, then... Start they need the to process, help. The yeah. government needs to help level the <laughs> playing field, as they do with ADA requirements for sure. you know, wheelchairs, Everything. accessibility. Like mm -hmm. it should be the same across the board. Yeah. And it's yeah. just kind of frustrating. We're not wasting our time, but it's a lot of time mm -hmm. that really Pam spends on the phone. We mm -hmm. called yeah. three ABA places this morning. Yeah, and getting the run around. Well, sorry, she's not potty trained. She can't come here. Well, where can she go? Yeah. Like there's got to be somebody that can right help us, her. or yeah, you yeah. Know, Pam can just go back to school and get be a BCBA, <laughs> yeah. and do it, Full and then turn. the state can pay us ninety thousand dollars a yeah, year. Right? I don't know. It's it's, it's wild, crazy. but just never stop advocating. Yeah. yeah, keep pushing. And yeah, connecting with people, I should be better about connecting with, but Pam's really good at it, so she does it for both of us. Yeah. But. Like even having you Katie learned. has been helpful in Ohio. Yeah. So like, All right, we're moving to Ohio. What's going on? She's like, buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so she gave you the heads up ride. that it's yeah. going to be a little bumpy. Yeah. She's in a different county than us. So Indiana, like the state of Indiana right. does the same thing. But in Ohio, it's like each county. So she's like, well, each county does a different. Every but... border every border you cross becomes yeah. a different, yeah. Yeah. A different yeah. level yeah. of bumps. Yeah. 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 And um, she's been through her own journey with Oren and his, like yeah. getting his needs met too. And so it's just. It's just different, like, and things have changed since when she tried to do this with Oren. So it's like, okay, what is, what has changed? What can we do? How can we get these services started as soon as possible and finding that? But she has been very helpful with helping, like, you need to get in contact with this person, with your county, and things like that. Like, because we moved, <laughs> we were with one family, and now we're with another family in Ohio, which I'm so glad we have somebody, like, here in Ohio, like they only yeah. live like an hour and a half away. So somebody was just diagnosed in mm -hmm. Cincinnati, according to the Facebook group. Yeah, someone so, just joined the Cincinnati. Yeah, but it's 
Yeah, it's a good community, but it's not like we're like, hey, let's set up a play date right now. We're <laughs> right, yeah, you. let's it's overwhelm not, them. Yeah, yeah, seriously, yeah. you just got a diagnosis. You're like, hey, we're here. If you ever but it has to, to be, out. it has to be helpful and encouraging to be on that side and to have someone reach out mm-hmm. and in a in a positive way say welcome to the club. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Versus yeah. the only Google, mm-hmm. yeah, which oh, yeah. I'm sure, like we always hear that that's the worst case scenario. It's oh, always the pictures there. on there. It's always are like awful. So and old with that and name, like, like coughings. I know you're like, like what? Okay. It's right. Just the doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is just the doctor's so the name. the ability to or to be able to connect so quickly mm-hmm. with people that will not only s- serve you as a person and help your emotional. Mm-hmm. Uh, state as you navigate that. Oh, yeah. But as we hear over and over, also be way more informed than yeah. what they're likely to encounter in their first medical visits. Mm-hmm. Not, And that's yeah. not a knock against the medical profession. Oh, it's no. just those people, it's so rare that those people haven't no, no. dealt with it. Yeah. So you can go, these f- families can go in way more equipped, way mm-hmm. more um, prepared for the right questions and the right outcomes and oh, yeah. like know what they need, how to advocate mm-hmm. versus just yeah. having to repeat the same thing. I don't know, but mm-hmm. something's wrong. But, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, that's really great that you guys were able to find that so quickly. Mm-hmm. I it know was, it's lucky. I mean, there's nice. a couple of guys call them kiddos, but adults with coffin years now that mm-hmm. you talk to their caregivers, their parents, you know, 30 years ago, it was not the same story. Oh, they had no And they, you know, they get a diagnosis when their kid is like 30 something like that's yeah. so great to finally have some answers. But And just I mean, to think like it's always growing and like they have a registry now. So like when you get a diagnosis, like we joined, like put Stella in that registry. So then they're getting more information from those kids too. So that when a new kid does get a diagnosis, like they have that information yeah. that we didn't have yeah. even right. five years ago. Right. So it's yeah. crazy. It's like a, it's more ever pieces evolving. to a puzzle. Yeah. 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 It's just wonderful. I mean, like I remember like when we first got on that page and just like looking through pictures of yeah, kids yeah. and being like, oh my gosh, oh. this kid has a similar feature. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, it's our family. Like it just like, it felt like that. Like, you yeah. know, like it's they're our family yeah. now. And, just like it felt really good to like just see kids that just have that those same features and similar interests to sell it. Yeah, yeah, and they're happy and they're normal families too. Like it's like, oh, yeah. what a relief. <laughs> We're not the only ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been great. Thank you guys yeah. so much for opening up your home and letting us visit for a bit of and to yeah. sharing um, Stella's journey. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's so cool. Your kids are awesome. Um, <laughs> you have uh, all of like all three of them are so cool yeah. in their own way. Mm-hmm. And uh, it seems we haven't really talked much about um, siblings, but it's it's clear that they interact well and mm-hmm. love each other well. Yeah. And um, yeah. she's an awesome siblings. big sister, and she has great younger siblings too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it'll be... The connection, is, as Stella yeah. gets older, she's connecting more with them, and seeing that bond yeah. is, is pretty cool. Like her like wanting to put shoes on her brother or touch her oh, sister's yeah. eyes, and yeah. she's actually like... Yeah interacting like when marshall was born she's like whatever yeah but now she like really wants to engage with them it's really cool yeah. to see it yeah. adds a whole dynamic because you think about marshall it's going we'll be going to kindergarten soon and you know he's getting exposed to more kids now like covid's maybe almost over one of these days <laughs> someday you know how he describes his sister how he cares for other kids with special needs how yeah. he stands up for her to against bullies how he interacts with her because sometimes he's three almost four he can be a bully but also still can pull his hair and take him out right. so it's normal sibling stuff but yeah. it's also like as we get older what's it what's it gonna look like for when stella is older and we we die mm-hmm. um, like will she be with her siblings but you don't want that on marshall but like i said that's all way in the future and <laughs> we try hopefully not to think about hopefully it. it's way in the future <laughs> oh, yeah cross your fingers um you know well, marshall where Aubrey take care of Stella. Yeah. But that's a lot to ask a kid, yeah. you know, like, yeah. hey, when we die, you are going to have to be Stella's caretaker. Yeah. But, you can never ask that. I just yeah. see what happens as time goes on. Yeah. yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic. But, yeah. But you know, today, seeing time, them yeah. together mm-hmm. is a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. He's such a good helper. Yeah. He, he is. is. He's very understanding. He's a really nice kid. He yeah. is. He's at Go Shout Love, we do amazing things for amazing families with kids on rare medical journeys. Each month, we shout love for families through the sale of creative apparel inspired by the kids. This month's Stay Curious design is inspired by Oren, Ruby, and Stella. Three amazing kids who are always up for an adventure. 
and shine a bright light wherever they go. Every purchase in January will help with the cost of adaptive bicycles for Ruby and Stella and a special trip for Oren and his family. Visit our website at goshout.love to support these three amazing kids through the purchase of a t-shirt, hat, sweatshirt, hoodie, or other items.